I got out in about two weeks after I got out, I was at uh, West Care and they knew I was a counselor, but I couldn't work there. And so a guy, I don't remember his name. I don't even remember what he looks like, but he, they were talking and the guy came in and said, oh, I know a guy that's looking for somebody to hire that's a certified counselor. And I said, well, I don't have my hours yet. I just, you know, and he said, I'm going to give you his number. It was yours. And so I didn't take him serious because, you know, I'm like, I'm fresh. Nobody's going to hire me. And I would happen to be at the nail shop and your number came out of my purse when I went to pay. And so I was like, let me just call. And I called and talked to you, and then um, you set up the interview for me. And I I remember that day because I walked in and I was like, I look like a parole officer because I was like in a suit with heels and it was just too much. But when I walked in, the energy that I felt, I was like, I'm supposed to be here. Welcome to Into Action, brought to you by Touchstone Recovery Center. This episode, I've asked Yannick Ortega to join me. Yannick is a really good friend of mine. We've worked together for the last three years. Um, quick story about Yannick. She, she walked in to a treatment center here in Fresno that Lewis and I were working at prior to Touchstone. I think it was over three years now. Mm-hmm. But um, when she walked in, she was looking for an internship. She was like really motivated. She was willing to work for nothing. And... Um, She came to work the next day and the day after that and the day after that until I think within three or four days, we were like, we have to hire this person. She's great. Um, And thank God we did because Touchstone is, it's like, you're the heartbeat of it. And um, the program wouldn't be half of what it is today without Yannick. So um, I'm really proud to, to still work with her and I'm happy to have you on today. Thank you. Yeah, how, how are you? Um, I'm doing good. Um, you know, excited about all the changes that are happening for Touchstone, the growth, um, the expansion. Uh, being able to work in this environment is, like, really fulfilling. Um, you know, I, I just recently got married, and that's beautiful. Um, I have two dogs that are crazy, but... I yeah. love them, um, you know, and life is really good considering where I came from, you know, before I walked through your doors. So, yeah, um, I'm, I'm blessed. So you just mentioned where you came from. And that's I know over the last few years, we've gotten to know each other really well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know a whole lot about like what brought you to this field and, you know, your own personal struggle with addiction. And so. I, I mean, that's what we do here on Into Action is like we talk about what happened, what we put ourselves through and our families through, what we went through to get to the other side, you know, and then how we maintain our sobriety today. So um, tell me a little bit about what, like your adolescence and growing up and um, any experiences you might have had with substance abuse at a young age. Um, growing up was really difficult. I was with my mother. Um for the earlier parts of my life. And, um, you know, on her side of the family, we have a long line of female alcoholics, some that don't believe that they are alcoholics. Um, Alcoholics go to meetings, right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And they don't. But, you know, there was a lot of neglect, um, a lot of violation from men um, towards me and... You know, my father, my mother kind of kept me away from my dad. And so I didn't have that protector. I didn't have someone that I could run to and, you know, tell them what was happening to me. Um, And because of the things now that I know this, you know, about addiction, the things that my mother went through when she was younger, um, you know, she was doing whatever she could to keep herself sane. Um... So I I turned more to the streets when I was younger. I was eating out of grocery stores, um, sleeping at friends' house, you know, to take a hot shower or to eat um, or to just sleep in a safe environment. And where was this? Um, I lived in Southern California. I lived in L.A., um, in the rougher parts of L.A. And so 
the lifestyle was, you know, selling drugs, gang banging. Um, the only thing I did continue to do was go to school. That was like my escape. I was able to go to school and then be on the dance team. I wanted to be a professional choreographer. Um, but to survive out there, I had to make a choice. It was either survive or go to dance class. Um, and I had to survive. So, um, you know, I had a rough start in the beginning of my life. And, you know, my father lived in um, a nicer area, big house, nice car. Um, he had my brothers. You know, they had the ideal life. But then there was also, you know, me being accustomed to doing whatever I wanted to do, coming in whenever I wanted to, no rules, no stipulations. And then him, you know, my mom, me and my mom got into it and she sent me to my father's house for punishment. And um, I didn't fit. I didn't fit in with their lifestyle, the curfews, the no TV throughout the weekday. Like, I didn't understand that. Um, and I had to look a certain way and present myself a certain way. And I was just used to being in the streets and um, making money. And um, in the process of being violated, you know, I come from a, a, a background where you don't talk about what's happening to you. You don't talk about um, if someone is touching you. You you keep it quiet to protect the family secrets. And so in order to, for me to keep it quiet, I had to use. I had to numb myself. And so I called myself a garbage pail kid because I did everything except for acid and PCP. Um, anything that would allow me to escape my situation or give me courage to um, respond or react in, to certain situations the way that I needed to, I would use it. Yeah. Um, a lot of my trauma, you know, was avoided um, or repressed because of the substances and because of the behaviors that I produced. You know, violence was also another addiction for me because it was my only way to express and to, you know, keep people away from me. So if I was, you know, violent, then people would be like, you know, she's crazy. I don't want to be around her. And that worked for me, you know. Um, but my father tried to take me and, you know, into the big house, nice school, nice cars and stuff. And I, it, it just didn't work for me. I, I was struggling with depression. Um, I, you know, at one point was suicidal. Um, and then I just used more. I drank more of whatever I could get my hands on to, to just escape everyone. I think the first time that I really felt love was when my father and my stepmom had my little brother. Like, I love that boy unconditionally. And I knew that, like, as he got older, he genuinely loved me. He looked up to me. And so... How um, old were you when he was born? Um, I was about 10, um, but I didn't go around him until I was about 16. Um, but when I had him with me, you know, off and on, when I was around him off and on, like, it was a bond there mm -hmm. because I think his innocence reminded me of the innocence I never got to have. Um, and so, like... I. Everything that he was a part of, I was there when I was with my father. And um, when I turned 17, I was starting to like go down more. Me and my stepmother didn't get along. Um, it was harder for me to get substances because of the area we lived in. I didn't really know that area like that. Um, so it became more of like alcohol. Couldn't just walk to the corner and score no, because yeah. you know L.A. is like it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and I was doing in L.A. I was doing everything. I was home invasions. I was, you know, selling drugs. I I did everything except for prostitution. Um, and in the midst of all of that, I was also um, dealing with my sexuality. It. There was, at that time, it wasn't a lot of acceptance for um, me being a lesbian. My mom didn't really care. My father was not having it. And mm -hmm. so... Um, you had to pretend to be I someone I had to pre pretend to be someone I wasn't, not 
talk about my feelings or and and my father was is really um you know reserved he doesn't there at the time he wasn't really res- a person that talked about his feelings or talked about what was wrong or you know it was like you do what i say and that's it um and i'll provide for you whatever you want um that's how a lot of the dads were in the 80s and yeah. early 90s i think yeah and you know i was a natural hustler so it's like oh you know, i don't need your money and i had that independence where like i wanted to make it on my own because i had been that's what i knew i've been surviving um when i turned 17 um it got worse for me and um i went to i i attempted suicide my stepmom and my father found me in my room across the hall from my little brother um, with a plastic bag over my head. And I had taken a bottle of pills. And um, I went to, um, I got 5150, then went to a mental institution. I was supposed to be there for a 72-hour hold, and I ended up staying there six months. Jeez. And Um, you were 17? I was 17. And then... um, I was just lost. I was broken. I, you know, I didn't know how to deal with my emotions. I didn't know how to deal with other people, you know, that tried to give me healthy love and understanding. Um, I had a, a, a dance teacher named Miss Todd, Kelly Todd. She, I don't know if I could say her whole name, but I did. <laughs> um, I will never forget her. Um, she was one of the, the one of the people in my life that, I felt like she knew what was going on with me, but, you know, didn't have the space to be able to help me in a way that would protect me because I wouldn't talk about it. Um, And so she made sure that all of my dance gear was paid for, the trips were paid for, um, you know, going to San Diego State to participate in the competitions. Um, she would pick me up. She got me into the theater arts department and I was in musicals. Like she gave me a different side of life. But again, I had to choose survival. Um, anyway, so when I got out of the mental institution, um, I, my father reminds me of this and I, I know it hurt him because he still talks about it. Um, they had like a round table with all of the, all of the, the staff and my 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 dad and they asked me, well, where do you want to be released to? And um, I said, I don't care. And they said, do you want to go to your dad? And I said, I don't care if I ever see him again. And at that time, I I think that I was just emotionally disconnected from everything, and I was going through so much that I didn't get to talk about. Um, and all the things that I was repressing with drugs and alcohol. Um, I just wouldn't allow myself to be vulnerable. Um, And then shortly after I got released, I got arrested and I was incarcerated. I had a 40 to life sentence. Jeez. um, And it was reduced to 16 to life. You know, the judge said, like, you didn't stand a chance. Um, And when I got to prison, I was worse. I mean, there was more drugs there than I think was on the streets. Um, Yeah, it's pretty pretty surprising how much paraphernalia there is in yeah. county jail and in prison. Yeah. The thing I, I draw a lot of similarities to your story. I know we have very different backgrounds, mm-hmm. but like, I think the common thread that I, I can relate to and I think a lot of people can relate to is like suppressing our emotions, suppressing yeah. our trauma and drinking and doing drugs and basically self-medicating and doing whatever we can to not feel, mm-hmm. you know, and then it... It becomes exponentially worse over time because Mm -hmm. repressed feelings, it's like, it's like a time bomb waiting to go off. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, I was, you know, I could do things to people and feel nothing, you know, and I know that's not, that's not natural human nature. Like we feel. Yeah. Um, I could, you know, talk down to someone. I could physically hurt them and I would feel nothing. Um, And the drugs helped me feel nothing. But I think also the brokenness that I felt didn't allow me to feel for other people. And um, not knowing how to get rid of it. Um, You know, when I got incarcerated, I didn't know that women were incarcerated the way that they were. 
or, you know, that um, people were going through the same things that I was going through outside of my neighborhood. Like, in my neighborhood, what I was going through was normal. Um, so, you know, I got to prison and I got, I was worse. I had become more violent. Um, you think that was out of like self-preservation? Were you, were you scared? You, you know, know why? unfortunately it's, it's really sad to say that I wasn't scared to go to prison. Um, I felt like the streets had prepared me for that life and I was okay with it. Hmm. Um, I was okay with having a life sentence. Like, did I want to be home and eat what I wanted and. But it didn't, it didn't change me. It didn't shift me to be like, wait a minute, my life is out of control. You know, it's not manageable. You need to get yeah. it together. It not was, yet. It, not yet. It was just like, okay, next chapter, like, you know, I'll adjust to this. Um, and it didn't, it didn't really phase me. And what I had done didn't really phase me. It didn't phase me at all. Um, and I justified my behaviors. I justified my emotions, I, I, I minimized everything that I did because I felt like the world owed me mm -hmm. because nobody saved me, nobody protected me. Um, and that's not true. You know, I did have people, regardless of how my dad handled things, he did try to provide a good house for me. Um, my mom only did what she knew how to do. And there were people that lived on the same block as me that they went off to college and became really successful. And I made choices that um, based off of what I knew instead of like reaching out to get something different. Um, but I took a lot of classes to get to that point, <laughs> to, to find that understanding. So tell me about that. Like I know, well, you were incarcerated. The beginning was rough, um, but I know that's where you turned it around because yeah. You, I know when when you were in there, you got you became a certified substance abuse counselor, and you started running groups and trying to help people. So when did that change happen? Um, so about maybe ten years in, my dad would come and see me um, consistently. Um, him and my godmom would they would come and see me consistently, and um, we never really actually talk about it. But like I look back at my pictures inside, and like I could see where I was like doing really bad. Like I had cut all my hair off. I was super skinny. You know, I would come up with like bite marks or from fighting people like trying to just get me off of them. And, and he never said anything. He just like, you're beautiful. I love you. He was just trying to feed into me. And my dad changed his life and, you know, became a pastor. And, um, you know, to, for me, he wanted to be better for me. And, so it took about 10 years, and um, the one particular night I was high, I was sitting in the bathroom, my roommates were asleep, and um, I put a sheet over the door, and I wanted to kill myself. And for whatever reason, um, I say it's a God thing, I couldn't get off that toilet. I couldn't, like, stand up and tie that sheet around my neck. And so I cried out to God, and I said, like, you know, either you change me or let me die because I don't want to keep living like this. And I feel like God said, oh, okay, challenge accepted. So um, gradually I started, I started sleeping on the pews at the chapel. Um, the chaplain there was really cool. And um, he let me sleep on the pews or lock, in the, lock me in the supply closet with the TV and I would watch the Ten Commandments. I love like that. Like while you're supposed to be working there? What do you mean? No, I've never, I, I didn't, well, I wasn't working at that time. You know, oh. I refused program. But um, no, he, you could get ducats to go to the chapel or whatever, and he would give me ducats. I had came to him and told him, like, I'm struggling and I need help. But I wasn't quite ready to do the God part yet. Um, so over time, I stopped sleeping while he was doing the Bible studies, and I started listening to the Bible studies. And then um, I got into a group called Houses of Healing, and then after that, it was just like um, staying off the yard you know, disassociating with certain people, um, you know, just changing my environment as much as I could a little bit. And then there was a mandatory uh, program that we had to go to as lifers before you went to board um, through West Care. And um, there was a counselor, Melissa Dickerson, who I wouldn't listen to anybody um, and I've heard you say her name before. Yes. Um, she's amazing. And she, 
she wouldn't stop until I just talked. She just was like, talk about it. Talk about whatever it is that's holding you back. And one day she got it out of me and I've never stopped. I, you know, I think that was the moment that my growth just really took off. And so um, I went to board. Well, while I was there, um, without throughout that time, I went to board. I got denied because I had so many write-ups. And then um, in the time I was waiting to go back, um, I went to school, participated in the OMCP program, um, which makes you a certified counselor. Um, and then I had to teach the classes to the inmates who did not want to be there and they were still in their addiction, um, which was really tough. So was it like punishment for them or was it something like a SAT program kind of thing? It was like a SAT program okay. where they had to participate in that, you know, for Because of their charges in yes. some cases. Got mm-hmm. it. Okay. And so um, I was teaching classes there and then I was teaching different types of groups all over the institution um, at night. And um, I became a certified paralegal. Like I just started... You know, using your time. Using my time. Of, yeah, yeah. And, and really taking advantage of the resources that they had there for us. And um, because my mindset was, even if I don't get out, I don't want to die like this. I don't want to die broken. I don't want to die um, unhealthy and not giving back. Um, and then I went to board again. Um, I had already graduated the program and they granted me parole. And I remember laying back on my bed, on my on my bunk, and saying to myself, because you still had to wait for the governor to say you could go. <laughs> um, I said to myself, if I get out of here, I am never going back to my old lifestyle, and I'm going to live my life in the way that I really want to. And so um, I got COVID <laughs> before I got out, and... Um, but I, I came out and any bad day out here is a beautiful day. Um, so that was, that was about three and a half years ago? Mm-hmm. And um, I got out and about two weeks after I got out, I was at uh, West Care and they knew I was a counselor, but I couldn't work there. And so a guy, I don't remember his name. I don't even remember what he looks like, but he, they were talking and the guy came in and said, oh, I know a guy that's looking for somebody to hire that's a certified counselor. And I said, well, I don't have my hours yet. I just, you know, and he said, I'm going to give you his number. It was yours. And so I didn't take him serious because, you know, I'm like, I'm fresh. Nobody's going to hire me. And I would happen to be at the nail shop. Get it's their nails. loss for not hiring you. <laughs> I, I happen to be at the nail shop um, and your number came out of my purse when I went to pay. And so I was like, let me just call. And I called and talked to you. And then um, you set up the interview for me. And I I remember that day because I walked in and I was like, I look like a parole officer because I was like in a suit with heels and it was just too much. Um, (laughs) But when I walked in, the energy that I felt, I was like, I'm supposed to be here. Um, I think going to school for for counseling and working with the inmates because you deal with like deep rooted trauma um, and addiction and resistance and resistance. um, It put me in a position to really like this is where my heart is. Counseling is where my heart is because you get to connect with people in, in their worst parts. And then, you know, now you get to see it more, but I get to see it more. But inside there would always be like one or two that you would see a breakthrough with and you're like that's beautiful um and now working working for touchstone um it's priceless to see how people come in and how they leave out and their stories like the stories in between the the struggles how they lean on us, how they depend on us, and how they trust us. Um, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do it any other way because I feel like this gives me purpose. Um, a person that you know has come from nothing, I had nothing, to a person that is like giving back constantly to another person and and a person trusting me with their life. Like that feels good every day. 
I think there's a lot of similarities between like our stories and then Lewis's story and so many people that we work with um, that, you know, we, we hit low bottoms, mm -hmm. like really low, ugly bottoms that took away not just like our self-respect, but like our freedom and our families. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a beautiful thing that we get to intervene before a lot of people get to that point, mm -hmm. you know, if, if they let us. Mm -hmm. But, you know, really, in, in the end, it's no one's going to save us. Mm -hmm. you know, we have to save ourselves, right? Yeah, yeah. So like if we're not ready to change, if we're not willing to, if nothing changes, nothing changes. Right. So if we're not ready to get away from those old associates and stop running with the, the gang on the corner and we, we have to change our circles. We have to change our habits. We have to, um, I know I had to change everything. I'm hell there's family. I don't talk to mm -hmm. and almost none of my old friends, like friends from 10 years ago, I never see them. Mm -hmm. And that's intentional. Unfortunately, right, right. you know, so I, I think starting fresh like you did and moving to a new area, that's smart. Yeah. Because you, you got to remake yourself and you, and you did, you've mm -hmm. remade yourself, mm -hmm. you know? I remember when you walked in, um, I think we had you come in and intern for like, what was it, three or four days before mm -hmm. we hired you? Yeah. And then before long, she's like, boss, you're bossing all of us around. <laughs> <laughs> she, but you're like a sponge and you, you moved up really fast. Yeah. And I know, I know the clients really benefit from it, from working with you. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I could say it's like my skills, my survival skills that have helped me. But I really feel like everything that I've experienced in my life was leading me to this point. Everything that um, I did or didn't do, everything I felt, everything I used, um, every encounter was preparing me to get to this point. You know, God was preparing me, you know, I, I really believe that um, I always had a purpose to help people, but I first had to find a way to help myself. Yep. Um, and I think that's important to to tell people is that like family members they you know they feel like just quit, and it's not yeah. it's not Stop that easy. Those pills. Yeah, it's so much that goes into the addiction and um, or into the emotions that you have that are contributing to the addiction is. And I I really like try to let the clients know that like. I'm here to give you, plant the seed, to give you the information, to to guide you, to support you, to be your biggest cheerleader. But it's you that has to do the work. You have to be vulnerable. You have to be in pain. You have to be um, willing. Honest. Honest with yourself, you know, and not minimize or blame other people. Like, it has to be you that brings that out. Because, you know, how no matter how uncomfortable I was, I wanted to be, my desire to be sober and genuinely internally happy was stronger than my desire to use and be violent. Yep. You know, I had to really make make another sacrifice, make another choice, and I had to survive in a different way. Um, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful for those choices because it's gotten me in a place where, you know, I'm surrounded. I'm not in my, you know, my city, but I'm surrounded by love and support. And, and you know, I have genuine friendships and it's different sometimes uncomfortable but but a good uncomfortable yeah um I think the thing that a lot of people struggle with most I know I did I I catch myself even now like um honesty was a the biggest issue for me like to get to change my life and change the way that I acted um honesty was the biggest problem. I, I would like make up these little white lies or these little stories to cover up something I did. And before I knew it, there was a mountain of lies and I'd, you know, they'd all come tumbling down and then I'd either like run for the hills or I'd go grab a bottle or I'd, you know, it, honesty was, I think the thing I struggled with most. And I think, I know that we see that with clients all the time where mm -hmm. these, these little lies and I mean, we're, we work in substance abuse. Like we know when somebody's making yeah. some stuff up, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I, I see it in people that I love that I know are active in their addiction. I see it 
when in some of the people that come here to Touchstone and um, I guess I guess when someone tells a lie, maybe that's like the first step. Like the maybe that means that they at least they know what they're doing is wrong, you know? Mm-hmm. Because if they were proud of it, they wouldn't lie about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, I agree with that. Um, if you, you know, and I tell people all the time, if you got to hide or lie about something you're doing. Maybe you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it. Yep. Because, and, you know, my problem was I was too blunt. I still got that problem a little <laughs> bit. <Yep. laughs> um, I've, I've tried to, like, pull it in. But I was too blunt. And I, I, I didn't care what you thought about me. I didn't care about, you know, what I'm doing is what I'm doing. And um, I think those are the hardest was, people to work with. Yeah, yeah. I was I was not easy. I was not easy. I'm sorry, Melissa. Um, I wasn't an easy client <laughs> at all. Um, but I think that for me, it was more like I don't want to add any more to what I have going on. And I was so angry that I wanted my words or whatever I was whatever I was doing to hurt you too because I was hurt. You know, misery loves com- company. I, I remember telling my best friend, she was laughing on the phone, and we still talk about this, and she she was laughing on the phone, and I turned and looked at her with probably the most miserable look I had and said, why the F are you so happy? And, you know, when I, like for somebody to say that to somebody that's happy, that's laughing, like you got to be in a really <laughs> dark place. But when you can start to be honest with yourself, even with me being blunt, I still had to be honest with myself about my behaviors and my thought process um, and how unhealthy I was, how toxic I was. Um, when you can start being honest with yourself about the things that you're doing and be honest with others, like say it out your mouth. I think that's the most powerful thing when you say it out loud, like, I'm not going to lie. This is what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. You know, it takes the power away from that action because now somebody else can hold you accountable. Yep. You know, um, now somebody else can pull you up. If you just hold it within yourself, how can somebody help you? You know, um, and shame and guilt is just it's a part of life. You're going to feel that, you know, if you lose a game or, um, you know, if your nails don't come out right, you, you're going to feel some type you know. <laughs> If your your hairstyle doesn't come out right, you're going to feel some type of way. But it's a moment. It passes. You know, it doesn't define who you are. It It's just a moment. And as long as you are able to acknowledge it and work through it, you'll be okay. So how, how do you uh, maintain your sobriety today? And I know for a lot of us, you know, some people subscribe to the 12 steps. Some people go to meetings. Some people go to church. Some people work in recovery and that does it for them. Um, what do you do? So I am a God girl. I, um, you know, I stay in my word and I, I stay prayed up. Um, but I also, because it's harder for me to go to meetings because half of the clients go to the meetings out here. Um, not that I have anything to hide from them, but I want to create a space for them where it's not a conflict. So I do work with different, um, nonprofit organizations. We have different online meetings where we get to talk about certain things. Um, And then I also do a lot of work, like outreach work that holds me accountable because I'm working with kids. Um, The homeless population. Yes, the homeless population, like, you know, women empowerment, um, different root and rebound, sister warriors. Like I work with different organizations where we hold meetings um, to hold ourselves accountable for, you know, what we're feeling, what we're thinking, what we're doing. Yep. Um, and then also, I, I, you know, for me, working in recovery also holds me accountable because we are guiding people on how to change their lives. And if they are leaning on me to be an example of what sobriety looks like, you better be standing up I straight. better be standing up straight and, yep. and walk in the walk because... One thing about an addict, they know another addict. And if I come in incorrect, they gonna call me. <laughs> they gonna call me on it. And so, um, but I think also too, loving life, not just about my sobriety, but loving being sober and then loving my life. Um, I should be dead, either through my violence, my actions, or my addiction. Loving my life. Um, 
keeps me sober because the bad days today don't match the bad days back then. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, um, I could be mad and still be sober, you know, yeah. instead of mad and in jail. So yeah. that's when I'm having a bad day and someone says, how you doing? I, I'll say like, I've been worse. Mm -hmm. You know, I've definitely been a lot worse. That usually makes you feel a little better. Yeah. And then reading, reading up on um, substance abuse is really, I take all your books. So, I know. <laughs> um, but reading up on substance abuse and, and recovery and how the mind works and the spirit, um, I take advantage of the things that we have here, yoga, meditation, um, like all those things come into play for me. Um, and I, I, I do a daily inventory every day from the 12 steps. I have to do that because I have to stay in tune with myself and see like, how did I respond to that? Could I have done better? Yep. You know, what was good about this? And then acknowledge my wrongs and then like go back and say, I was wrong for that. You know, um, those things hold me like in my sobriety, hold me accountable. Yep. Well, thank you very much, Yannick. I, I love having the, I love having a conversation with you. I love have, working with you. Um, I'm really excited for like what the future holds and I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I'm proud of you too. Cause you. I mean, this is, this company is, is really expanding in a way that is touching more people. The name touchstone means a lot in this city and, f and further on. And, you know, you, you know, we play a part in it, but you play the biggest part because this is your vision. It's us. Yeah. Thanks.